can you give uh, can you give my audience just uh, I guess a brief uh, bio or, or background for yourself? Yeah, thanks for asking. I'm Dr. John DeGarmo, founder and director of the Foster Care Institute. I've been a foster parent myself to over 60 plus children who have come through my home as young as 27 hours old and as old as 18 years of age. I've had as many as 11 kids in my house at the same time, including seven in diapers at one point. Um, I've adopted three from foster care. I work with child welfare agencies across the globe trying to make the system a better one for the children, for the families, for society, try to prevent human trafficking from happening, and uh, work with legislators in the United States and trying to reform the system. And you're a doctor by trade. Are you still practicing? And, and how did that come about, I guess, in your younger days? Well, it wasn't something I really planned on doing, um, but I noticed I used to be t I used to be a teacher. And I noticed okay. in my classroom that a number of my kids were coming uh, in, in my classroom had issues of behavior and academics, which led to fostering. And I recognized that teachers were not equipped here in the United States, nor really globally, to address the many challenges that kids in foster care had. They slipped through the cracks. They slipped through the cracks in schools. 55% will drop out of school. So that was my, uh, that was my PhD, was on focusing on that. Okay. And what, what were you teaching and whereabouts? I was teaching and taught in Australia. I taught in Michigan and I taught in Georgia. I've taught history, English, and drama. So your experience in the classroom, uh, and were the, was this in a, in a tougher area where you saw a lot of these problems or was it kind of wherever you taught, uh, you're exposed to these issues? Well, let's step back a minute here. Really, what led me to foster parenting was the death of my first child. Our first child died of a condition called anencephaly, or some pronounce it anencephaly. It's a condition where the brain or skull doesn't truly form. And my wife was in labor for 92 hours, and uh, I turned my back on a lot of things at that point. But then when we moved back to the United States, she's from Australia, we were living there. That's when I started teaching in a rural school system in middle Georgia, very rural, filled with a lot of... Uh, apathy and a lot of poverty. And that's when I noticed generational apathy. Um, it's mm. generation to the generation. That must have been incredibly difficult losing a child. Have you, I mean, probably no one ever fully gets over that, but what, what has helped you cope with that? Well, What's helped cope me with that is uh, caring for 60 other children. I've really devoted my entire life to helping other children in crisis. You know, I, I lost my first child. I've had three healthy children since then. I've adopted three children. But the kids who've come through my home from foster care are also part of my family. So I have a very extended family, if you will. Right. So what, what did the, I guess, paint a picture, what did the first steps look like uh, becoming a foster parent, how did you how did you go about it, and I guess what did you think of the system there? I believe the myths and misconceptions of the system. I believe the kids are bad kids, and foster parents are weird people. That part's a little bit true. We got to be a little bit weird to do what we do because it's a very unique lifestyle. When you bring a child into your home who is filled with trauma, who is filled with anxiety, who may have issues of attachment, may have issues with trust, maybe eating disorders, sleeping disorders, anger management, whatever it might be. And you're caring for them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's that's that can be tough. Um, so I believe those myths and misconceptions. I, I never set out to be a foster parent, but I went to my wife one day and said, "Hey, I've got these three. I've got the I've got a student in my classroom who's pregnant with triplets. Uh, what if I brought them home?" And she said, "Well, as long as you start changing the diapers for those kids." In addition, very close to my house was a um, was a human sex trafficking ring and and uh the, the gentleman dr malachi york of the nuwabian nation you can find it online he apparently has abused over a thousand children sexually so the combination of and some of those kids are in my classroom so a combination of of a student being pregnant with triplets child sex trafficking happening happening where i was working at that really led to discussion of, hey, how do we help these kids? 
and that led to foster parenting. That led to the discussion of foster parenting. Then we took the classes, and before we knew it, we had our first placement. And I will tell you this, ten, uh, the first placement arrived at 10.30 at night. It was a four-year-old girl and her six-month-old sister, and I recognized 20 minutes later at 10.50 that I was not ready. I was not prepared. My training did not prepare me for it. Um, it was uh, It was difficult, yeah. What did that must have been incredibly difficult being a teacher and navigating that situation with the the student to to take in her triplets? You said, yeah. How how complex was that situation? Did, what, did you have to go through different channels to make that, or, or was it more of a more of a you know a one on one with that student? How did that work? Well, we were unable to take that those triplets um, because by the time okay. we finished our foster parenting classes, the triplets are born and placed someplace else. So, but it did lead to that discussion. Um, mm. So, so you know, but we went to the parenting, we went to the foster parenting training classes that are required to get licensed, and and uh, yeah, it was a it was a unique experience to be sure. So, can you explain the difference between fostering a child and adopting a child oh, just for, for clarity for everyone. Absolutely. So as a foster parent, a child is placed in the foster care system um, for a, a number of reasons, abuse, neglect, abandonment. We've had all those. Um, and they're there for, uh, it's apparently for a short amount. It should be for a short amount of time while the birth parents or biological family members, they go through a number of courses and classes you know, they, they parenting classes, if you will, if they're on drugs, you know, to, to wean out those drugs. And then reunification. Reunification is the end goal of foster care. Reunification is when the birth parents and the child are reunified, if you will. 50% of the time, kids in foster care are reunified. Adoption from the foster care system uh, results when the birth parents are unable to fulfill the requirements to have their child return to their home. And then it's known as termination of parental rights. The, the parental rights are terminated by the courts. And then the children become available for adoption. And that's how we uh, became adoptive parents of those three children. We were fostering them. Um, and then they had termination of parental rights. So we uh, welcomed them to our family forever. Right. So I'm sure you, you early on, you uh, became aware, I guess, of what your maximum capacity would be <laughs> as far as how many children you could, you could foster or adopt. W what, what is that, do you think? And, or what is it for you? Well, I told you we've had as many as 11 at the same time, which is very unusual. The limit for most states is six. But since there's such a a need for foster parents. There are more children coming into the system, yet there are not enough foster parents. So me being the national expert, the agencies just say, you know what, the DeGarmels will take more kids. We'll just keep giving them more kids. Um, I don't know what my limit is. 11 is a lot of kids. Let me tell you, it's exhausting. It is exhausting. Um, I, I noted earlier, we had seven in diapers, which meant pretty much every waking minute, <laughs> a child needed a diaper change. Um, yeah, yeah. When we go to any event, we're like a clown car because kids just keep coming out of the car and out of the car and out of the car. Um, we have our own baseball team, you know. Wow. Wow. That's, that's, that's pretty neat. Do you, are you able as a foster parent to be involved in where that child ends up or goes, or is that completely left up to the state? It's a great. What, how are you involved in that process? It's a great question. It's left up to the state, you know, um, unless, of course, it's for adoption. Now, I do need to add that when it comes to termination of parental rights, the first people who are able to adopt a child might be biological family members, grandparents, aunts, uncles, maybe older siblings. And then if no one's available, then the foster parents usually get the first right to adopt. We've experienced four failed adoptions, which means for some reason the adoption process did not go through. Um, but normally the foster parents have very little say when it comes to where a child goes. And that is tough for a foster parent because I believe children in foster care need three things. They need stability, they need structure, but what they need more than anything else is unconditional love. They need us to love them with all mm -hmm. of their hearts um, because we might be the first person who's ever loved them. So that means when they leave our home, for whatever reason it might be, 
yeah, our hearts break, absolutely break. I've cried so many times for these children when they've left my home. I've grieved them. Foster parents experience feelings of grief and loss because I wonder, you know, to this day, I wonder how is so-and-so doing? You know, is so-and-so safe? This, today is so-and-so's birthday. Um, you know, what, what are they doing? How are, how are they? So I often wonder where they are. Right, right. So you probably more than more than almost anyone ha- have been in, you know, contact with the foster care and adoption system in the, in the U.S. Uh, does it does it differ drastically from state to state? It does, and I've also worked in Canada as well several times. Uh, yes, okay. in the America in the United States, there's fifty different states, which means there's fifty different ways of doing foster care. A lot of similarities. But there's also differences in policies and procedures as well. What are the biggest issues that that you see with the way, on average, things are done? Uh, what what's the biggest? Are you asking maybe what the biggest challenge might be? Yeah, with with the legislation, with how with, with the states. Um, child welfare agencies today are overworked, overwhelmed, under resourced, under supported, understaffed, and underpaid. Your your average caseworker might or social worker might last eighteen months before they say, "Ah, this is too tough for me. I'm out of here." Same thing with foster parents. They say they may last 18 mm. months before they say, hey, I can't do this. This is too hard. Um, so there there needs to be uh, a, a, a smaller ratio of foster parents to caseworkers. We did a survey of over 5,000 foster parents here at the Foster Care Institute. And we asked them, what's the number one reason why you're quitting? And by far, the number one reason was we don't get enough support when we're, when we're experiencing burnout, stress, grief, loss, compassion, fatigue. At the same time, caseworkers or social workers can't help those foster parents because they're inundated with so much paperwork to do. And they have so many other foster parents they have to work with. And there's visitations, there's court, there's doctor's appointments, there's meetings. Um, So they don't have enough time really to address the foster parents. And as a result, foster parents are saying, hey, no one's helping me. I I can't do this anymore. So I would, first thing I would do is I would lower that ratio so caseworkers have more time to work with their foster parents, thus we're able to retain our foster parents. The retention rate is so is so fluid. Many foster parents are quitting. So where do these kids go? And then let's look, let's look at the opiate epidemic. When the parents are incarcerated due to their opiate epidemic, their opiate addictions, where do they go? When they're hospitalized, where do they go? When they die from their opiates, where do they go? Flooding into a foster care system that can't handle it. The United States, Texas, and Mexico border, children are flooding over the border, open borders right now. Many of those kids are, are here for human trafficking. Um, where do those kids go? They're going to the foster care system that can't handle it. Teenage suicide attempts are up 70% since COVID. Um, a lot of teenage depression. Where do these kids go? Going to a system that can't help it. Wow. Is the, I guess, I don't know if there is one single factor. You mentioned the opioid epidemic, but what are the, some of the major factors that end up in a parent not being fit to look after their children neglect neglect i've had right. i've had I, I recall a time we had a four-year-old boy placed in our home who could only speak two words and had no teeth all the teeth were rotted out uh, neglect um his two words were me hungry that's all i could say were me hungry me hungry me hungry me hungry um and he had been completely neglected uh, i recall a 10 year old boy we had in our house didn't know how to didn't know the words happy birthday because no one ever sung it to him before. They've been neglected. Um, yeah. You know, I also want to add that in the United States, every year, 5 million children experience domestic violence or witness domestic violence in their house every year as well. So child abuse is, is huge as well in that regard. And I mean, neglect is, ne- neglect is such a broad term. Is there it is. specific causes for, for neglect, or is it is it just you know lack of character among those parents? Well, many are addicted to opiates, um, or perhaps the parents are struggling with their own trauma, their own anxiety. I've had several kids in my home who have been generational foster care. You know, their parents are in foster care, their grandparents are in foster care, and they never got the help they needed. Um, I recall two girls we had in our house whose mother was prostituted out by age nine. And, you know, she never got the help that she needed. And she was still a prostitute when she was a mother to these kids because that's all she knew since age nine. So she neglected her kids. 
because she was struggling herself. Um, yeah, there's there neglect. Neglect comes in different forms and different reasons. Hmm. What what can you or what do you see would help on on that end on the on the the parents end? Maybe maybe you're not the guy to ask, but because you're on the receiving end of, of children. But what do you what do you think can help? Uh, you know, how how can you give resources or whatever it may be to help help parents um, who are dealing with with their own trauma and issues? Well, before a child is placed in the foster care system, child welfare can come around that family and provide some wraparound support services for them, perhaps counseling services, perhaps parenting classes, perhaps professional therapy sessions for those parents who might be suffering with their own trauma and anxiety um, in order to heal the whole family before the child is placed into care. That's one thing that we can do. Right. Now, uh, you're advocating for foster care reform. Right. What What specifically are you are you doing there? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one thing would be to lower the ratio between foster parents and caseworkers to give foster parents more support and caseworkers more support. In addition, mm-hmm. let's go back to reunification where I said 50% of kids in foster care are reunified. Sadly, 20, 20 to 30% of those kids who go back home come back into care, come back into foster care care later on perhaps their family members were not ready yet perhaps they sank into their own addictions once more Um, perhaps their trauma overwhelmed them Um, perhaps they um, they uh, were suffering from something else and those children when they come back into care they're far more traumatized filled with far more anxiety have more issues of trust and attachment and sometimes when they go back home they even up dead they even up they end up dead. I've, I've spoken about this many times on many networks about it. So I re- am suggesting reform where we place more support services for that child. So when the child goes back home to mom and dad, if you will, mm-hmm. many times foster, the support services end. The child goes back home and child welfare says, okay, we have reunification. This is what we wanted. And we move on to the next family. And they just leave that family there. Well, I would like to see child welfare wrap around those families for support services for six months to a year to provide additional help to those families when they're struggling so the child does not come back into care. Right. Now, is it, um, I, like I said, you know, obviously there's a big process, but I assume an increase in funding alleviates a lot of these problems. Is that something you're you're working on with, with legislators to to increase funding for the foster care program? It does help. Child welfare workers are criminally underpaid, really, really underpaid. Um, and as a result, many of them say, you know, and the job is so tough. The job is so difficult. Mm-hmm. Not a nine to five job. And when a child is placed in a foster care, or when when the child welfare services has to remove a child at night, it could be as late as 10:30, 11 o'clock at night, or maybe one or two o'clock in the morning. Um, and that child welfare agent needs to be there. That social worker needs to be there for that child. Um, and I've spoken to many child welfare workers who say, you know, they don't have time for their own family because they're working with other families uh, for such little, little pay. And the burnout and the stress mm-hmm. is very high among them. So I was, yes, yeah, some of that funding can certainly go towards giving the child welfare agencies um, an increase in pay, an increase in salary. Yes. And, and also funding can also go towards therapy and counseling sessions for the children while they are in foster care as well. What's the, what's the, like, it seems like such a, such a bipartisan issue. Like it's, it, you know, it, how can this be a, a losing proposition for any politician? What is, what is the, the major issue there? It, you know, it should be bipartisan. The reality is, it's an issue that people don't want to address or discuss. Uh, I often call human trafficking in the United States, America's ugly secret. It makes us feel uncomfortable. So we talk about something right. else. We don't address it. We talk about something else. Same thing with foster care. So it makes us feel uncomfortable that child abuse is happening right where we live in every single community. As I said earlier, 5 million children experience domestic violence every year in the United States, 800,000 children missing, 300,000 children victims of human trafficking, 500,000 kids in foster care. It means it's every, it's everywhere. It's every community. 
but it makes us feel uncomfortable. So because maybe it's part of our own family, maybe somebody in our family is abusing a child or neglecting a child and we don't want to speak up about it. So we address something else instead. It's the same thing our legislators are doing. They don't address those topics. They address something else. And I continue to tell legislators that these aren't goods and services. These are lives of children. And the longer that we wait or the longer that we drag our feet in addressing this, the more children are suffering or even dying. So, yeah, so, so in your analysis, it's it's just that it's not a... It's not sexy. It's not a good talking point. Exactly. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. And it's and in, in fact, it's actually ugly, and it's something that people don't want to look at to, to turn their eyes towards the the suffering that's in their own backyard. Right, right. Many legislators are well, sadly working on other issues that that might be more appealing to voters. Right. Hmm. Having so many uh, different types of or different children through your home at different ages and, and, you know, coming from different backgrounds. Are there, I think you, you said it briefly before, but can you elaborate on, on kind of the universal parenting, uh, for lack of a better word, techniques that you've, you've learned? <laughs> uh, flexibility. <laughs> uh, every child is different to be sure. Um, you know, laughter is a good, stress relief um mm. and take myself seriously uh you know when when i go to work sometimes to rest because when i come back home and i got 11 kids in my house or nine kids 10 kids whatever it might be laundry cooking cleaning doctors homework trauma screaming rage whatever it might be and that can be overwhelming it can be exhausting um but what i also know is that every child deserves to be loved every child needs to be loved every child needs safety security stability consistency and that's something that my wife and i really try to focus on having consistency in the household so a child feels safe giving unconditional love to that child so they can begin to heal from some of the trauma they've experienced many children in foster care um have issues of trust and attachment because they may have moved to so many homes or they may have been abused so many times by those people who say they love them. They don't trust us, and why should they? So patience as well. We, we, you know, we, we give the gift of time for these kids that come into our home to learn that, hey, this Dr. John guy, he's, he's not going to hurt me. He, my, I might be safe in this family, um, and maybe I'm going to be okay. You know, when they come to our house, they have questions like, why am I here? When do I go home? What, when will I see mommy again? Did I do something wrong? Is it my fault? Does anybody love me? Will these people hurt me? What are their rules? Um, so, and then they cry themselves to sleep those first few nights because they're so scared. Now, I can provide the most stable, secure, um, safe home. But at the end of the day, I am a stranger to these children. And my house is a, is a strange place to them. And many times they want to go back to that place of familiar, familiarity for them, the place that they know, even though it may be horrifically traumatic, horrifically abusive. That's their norm. That's their norm. Mm. My norm is not their norm. Um, so we have to give them that gift of time to, to recognize that they're going to be okay, they're going to be safe, and that we do care for them. We're going to here to help them. But that may take them some time to understand that. So, you know, you asked about parenting, stability, structure, consistency, unconditional love, and time. Right. How difficult was it initially um, as far as continually integrating, you know, new new kids into your house and then having some leave and your own biological kids there as well? And how did, what, how did that, I guess, how did that conversation happen with your own kids initially and say, hey, this is what we're going to be doing? You know, I think when we started, my oldest was six years old. Um, is that right? Perhaps. Perhaps. Uh, five, maybe five years of age. Uh, so it's all my kids have known. It's all they've known mm -hmm. is having other siblings, other brothers and sisters in the home. Um, but, you know, we'll sit down and have a discussion about each child that comes through there and, you know, give as much information as we can to the kids. 
and let them know, you know, this is what's coming. How do you feel about this? And sometimes we take a break. Sometimes we say no to a placement because it might not be a good fit for our family. Has every fam fit, uh, placement been a, a good fit for the family? No. There have been times where my own kids have said, Dad, these kids are driving me crazy. And I say, yeah, I get it. Mm. I know. I understand. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't know if any of my kids will be foster parents. Perhaps none of them will be foster parents. I also believe that every one of my children will lead a life of serving others in some way because they have looked abuse and neglect in the eye at children their own age, their friends. They've grown friends and family members, and they have learned to recognize the signs and how to help, perhaps more so than any of their peers their age at school because they're living with it um, and, they're, and they're helping those kids. So they're the first ones I have found to stand up for bullying. They're the first ones who stand up for injustice. They're the first ones who will stand up and say, hey, how can I help you? They're all very, very compassionate right. towards others. Did you always have the, um, I guess, the your attitude towards serving? Did you always have that attitude or was it did it grow with you through through becoming a foster parent and that it, that it was the thing to do? I've always had it in some way. I've always wanted to help okay. other people in some way. Um, I met my wife when I was 21. She was 19. We were traveling the globe, singing and dancing at a performing group, as well as doing community service for a year across the mm. world. So when we came into our marriage together, we both came from that life of serving others. Um, so foster parenting was kind of a natural fit for the two of us. You know, how can we, as I said, how can we help these kids? And that led to the discussion of let's bring them home. Right. Can you articulate a little bit? Cause I think we live in such a more and more, a, a self-centered culture, uh, you know, being, being kind of shoved down our throats and say, you know, the, whatever, whatever it may be through different media saying, this is how you'll find gratification or happiness, you know? Um, kind of a vapid metric of, of life. Right. Uh, can you articulate what serving has has brought to you personally? <laughs> it has made me a better person in every way. Every child has made me a better person in some way. Watching a child, a four-year-old girl, who had experienced horrific rape all through her life by her grandfather, um, watching her learn how to smile, Watching her learn how to laugh, amazing. Watching a 14-year-old boy who had never received a gift in his life and unwrapping a present on Christmas Day, a leather jacket, and asking, can I keep this? A kid tough as nails. Um, and we said yes, and he started crying. He had never received a gift before. Um, watching a child who had gone through three adoptive families who all abused her and then gave her back watching her at 17 years of age having no didn't, didn't trust anybody helping her go to college and now she is a child welfare worker herself and we're grandparents to her children you know i have been blessed by every child that's come in my home and i have been so fortunate to have these kids be a part of my family. As I said earlier, every child's made me a better person, better husband, better father, better member, member of community in some way. What do you say or what is your counter, if, if at all, to, uh, again, in our culture, the growing sentiment that having children is the wrong thing to do? Well, if having the children is the wrong thing to do, then you and I wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> it would cease to exist, right? Um, to me, children have been the biggest blessing. You know, I, I have a house full right now of, 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 of kids. And just the daily joys, the daily curiosities, the daily adventures. Um, wow, it's just magical, magical. That 10-year-old girl right now who's, who's uh, loving a pair of binoculars that she got, and we go out and watch birds together. She loves it. Uh, teaching my kids how to garden. Um, it's just a wonderful gift. Wonderful gift. Right. 
and then I guess, you know, being, I, I think, a, I think everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people have, have this, um, you know, this desire to serve and a lot of people don't know where to begin. Uh, you know, I guess, I guess, how would you guide people, uh, find where, where they can serve and, and, you know, in what capacity? Well, I'll start off by saying not everybody can be a foster parent. It's the toughest thing I have ever done. Toughest thing. At the same time, it's been the most rewarding thing. But if someone is considering becoming a foster parent, the first thing I suggest that they do, in fact, what they need to do, is sit down and talk to their partner, their spouse, if they're married. Because you both have to be on board. You both have to be committed because it takes both of you to make it work. There are days where I say to my wife, I'm just exhausted. I'm worn out emotionally. And she might say the same thing. Though. So we, we, we tag sometimes. And then um, if both are on board, you contact your ch local child welfare agency. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be married. You don't have to have a big house. You just have a desire to help these kids. Now, if you can't be a foster parent, there are so many ways you can help children in your area where you live right now at this at the time. You could be a mentor to these kids. You could provide school supplies, I mean, hygiene items. Some of these kids come to our house with just the clothes on their back. I've had I had some kids, a, a group, a sibling group of five, who showed up with their clothes stapled together, and we had to burn the clothing because the clothing was contaminated with with meth and feces. Um, oh, you know, geez. provide clothing, um, school supplies. Um, you could provide meals for the foster parents in your area. If you own a small business, you could hire some of these youth and or teens in foster care to teach them important work skills, uh, living skills, social skills. Those are just a few of the many, many ways. I, I do a deep dive in my book, The Church and Foster Care, because I believe, I believe that today's faith-based organizations are called, you know, listen, I went to Mexico. My kids have been to Honduras and Nicaragua for mission fields. But the real mission field is every community's backyard. Because as you and I are having this conversation right now, near where you live and near where I live, there's a child crying out, please help me. Please, somebody help me. So that means we can all help a child where we live in some way. Right. Now, what are your thoughts on, um, you know, I look at it, I'm, I'm such a young adult and I battle with this internally that I've got to, I've got to make more of myself first and, and probably become wiser before I stick my finger in, you know, meddling in society. Um, I mean, you became a foster parent pretty young, it sounds like. Uh, how old was I? Uh, I could have been 30-something. Um, right. Um, and you know what? I, as I told you earlier, I, I had three kids of my own. I was a teacher. My wife had a degree in psychology. Um, we both recognized 20 minutes. Hey, we're not ready. We're not ready for this. We're not, we're not equipped. We didn't get trained on this. So it's always learning. Oh, every time a child's placed in my home, I'm going to learn something different. It's always, you know, always learning. Knowledge is power, right? Um, and I, and I'm grateful for those opportunities to learn. So I would say to someone like you, who is, who thinks they need to have more experience, Again, if you have a desire to help children in your heart, then you can do so in some way. Whether you bring them in your home or you're a mentor for a child in your community or maybe a tutor or providing those school supplies or hygiene items or Christmas gifts for the foster parents in your area. Um, so, many, so many times foster parents, yes, we get a per diem, a daily per diem. It's not much. It really doesn't cover a lot. Uh, so when a child comes into my house, I want to make sure their Christmases and birthdays are huge. Something to really, really celebrate because it could be the very first time they have one. And it might be the last time they have one. So I want to make it very, very memorable. So that means I'm digging into my own wallet and, and spending my own money. That's perfectly fine. I have no problem with that. In fact, I welcome that. But there are people like you who can say, you know what? I can help. I can go and buy some gifts or donate some money to the local child welfare agencies in my area for Christmas time or birthdays or whatever it might be. Um... So I would just say to someone like you, find out where your talents lie and see how you can share those talents. Right, right. What do you do um, to ensure that you're recharged and, and showing up kind of at, at your best? 
I'm a garden. What kind of do you have, do you have practices or yeah. church or meditation or whatever it may be? Uh, a number of things. I love the garden. I love the garden. So I go mm-hmm. outside and, and garden. It allows me to escape. Um, behind me, you see my library. I love to read. Uh, I like to read. People say, have you read this foster care book? Have you seen this foster parenting movie? Nope, I live it. So I read something to escape. I do escapism. Um, science fiction, fantasy, this type of thing. Uh, prayer for me in the morning is very, very, and throughout, actually throughout the day, throughout the day is very important as well. Um, and then, you know, I rely upon my own friends. Uh, I do a lot. My wife is from Australia, so we travel the world. Uh, we were in Africa recently, Costa Rica. Um, and again, it gives me a lot, allows me the opportunity to recharge those batteries so I do not become burned out. And I have been burned out. I have been something known as secondary traumatic stress or compassion fatigue. I love that mm-hmm. word, compassion fatigue. Fatigue, exhaustion from compassion, from caring so much. Um, and that's a very real condition for those for, for caretakers. So I am conscious of the fact that I've experienced those before and how do I prevent that from happening again? My wife, she likes to uh, climb into bed 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night and start playing Candy Crush. I don't understand it. I don't get it. But that's what she does. It's able to, She's able to just escape into something mindless. Right. Right. And I think it, this might be different for everyone. And I think everyone um, kind of struggles with this. The balance between looking... And, and you're so exposed to it clearly is suffering. The balance between looking suffering in the eye and, you know, how, how hard and difficult and how much of that, that takes of you. And at the same time, you know, it's, it's, it's God's will. This is all perfect as well. How do you, how do you, how do you, kind of find that balance and and sometimes you know in my in my life it's you can become cold and and say you know it's all perfect and or you can you know be crying all the time (laughs) well i cry a lot um you know i want to go back to something a minute ago i didn't say self-care is important for for foster parents and caretakers in general because if i can't care for myself i can't care for these kids you mentioned God's will. Well, God gives us free will. God gives everyone free will. So people have the freedom to make choices. And there are a lot of bad people out there who make really bad choices. As I said earlier, 5 million children in the United States alone every year experience domestic violence in their own house. So um, I recognize it's happening everywhere. And if I am not going to help them, then who will? Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I appreciate it. Can you can you leave me with? I'm a uh, I've got a six month old at home. He's my first son. Can you leave me with some some parental advice for uh, <laughs> uh, that that is practical? <laughs> You're not going to sleep for a while. Um, <laughs> what sleep? Um, oh, I know that. So if you have one child in diapers, imagine what it's like with seven. That was, it was. I can't, I can't imagine. Uh, I, I think back to the Christmas, we had seven in diapers. And I think I call it the very smelly Christmas. Every 20 minutes, Christmas morning, it was, oh, I gotta go. Gotta change another diaper. Uh, what advice would I give you? Buckle up, enjoy the journey. Um, be flexible, particularly as children grow older. You know, you've got to have you've got to have consistent rules in place. Children thrive on consistency. They thrive on consistency, and that's how they grow. Um, learning never stops for you, as well as for your child. Learning never stops. So you need to be learning new things as the child grows older. Be very involved in their schooling. Very involved in the schooling. Don't be one of those parents who the teachers never hear from. Hmm. Uh, be one of those parents that the teacher does hear from because the teacher knows that, hey, you're involved, you care, they can contact you if there's a problem. Um, encourage your child daily to try something new and exciting and learn something new. Um, but yeah, I'll go back to consistency, structure. Children need structure, children need consistency. And again, buckle up, enjoy the adventure because it's. Uh, it's magical being a parent. It's so, I, I never, I mean, I never expect. I never expected it. I never expected it. <laughs> I, I didn't. And uh, my wife, my wife, um, 
she wanted a lot of kids. I didn't. And now I could easily take more because I've loved being a parent so much. It's just been the best. It's fun. It's great times. All right. Well, I appreciate you taking the time, Dr. John. Hey, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. See you guys next week.